I hope after our time together this morning you took time to read through the entirety of Proverbs chapter 3, noting what we had briefly discussed as well as the rest of rest of that chapter. And the second part of this, this chapter, talking about these proverbial principles for the new year, we're going to pick up where we left off, but let's kind of recap just maybe with a word or two what we've talked about already. Verse 3 and verse 4, the priority. Let mercy, love, kindness be something that is always present with you. You bind those around your neck. You write them on your heart. The principle of trusting in the Lord with all your heart, leaning not on your own understanding. The precaution that one not be wise in their own eyes. Arrogance is never becoming, even if you think you're right. Still be open enough to investigate what you believe you already know and the conclusions you've already reached. Verse 9 and verse 10, presenting those things that God has blessed us with back to, back to Him. Verse 11 and verse 12, looking upon the, the, the problems or the afflictions or the, the, the detours in life as mid-course corrections, not as punishment. And then down in verse 13 and following, dealing with procuring or attaining wisdom itself. We talked about the first half of this. It's it's a passage that starts in verse 13 of this third chapter, goes all the way through verse 24. We briefly mentioned the first 18 verses where the benefit of wisdom is something that is touted in very, very strong ways. I want to give some examples of that, which is exactly what happens beginning in verse 19. The Lord, by wisdom, founded the earth. By understanding, he established the heavens. By his knowledge, the depths were broken up and clouds dropped down the dew. My son, let them not depart from your eyes. Keep sound wisdom and discretion so there will be life to your soul and grace to your neck. Those kind of things that wisdom that understanding, that knowledge, and a way to very skillfully and discreetly go through it without any arrogance, without any desire to prove that I am always right, is something that's got to be apparent. And it's missing in a lot of our culture. Sometimes it's missing within religious circles as well. So the way that that sixth point takes up about half of it, gives our priority again to the fact that we need to attain this in a very real way and utilize it every day. Well, what about situations that happen that kind of go back to, uh, I just was not expecting something this tragic or traumatic to come my way when I have been in, endeavoring to live in a way that I'm basing my life on the knowledge of God's Word and the the wisdom I can receive from following what I find in God's Word. Verse 25 and verse 26. Point number 7. Do not be afraid of sudden terror, nor of trouble from the wicked when it comes. For the Lord will be your confidence and will keep your foot from being caught. And sometimes passages like this say, well, no, wait a minute, wait a minute. The, the nation of Israel suffered a lot. Well, why did they suffer? They actually kind of forsook God. Well, yeah, but there are individuals that were living righteous lives. There were righteous Israelites that were caught up in the Babylonian captivity, just like those that were unrighteous. That's true. Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, Azariah, four good examples of individuals that were endeavoring to be righteous, especially Daniel. But the other three as well. You see individuals when they came back, and you see individuals that are endeavoring to live righteous lives. Even when Jesus is born, you think about those individuals there in the temple, Simeon and Anna, and, and individuals that are anticipating the promises of God coming to fulfillment, endeavoring to live righteous lives. But the statement, a statement to which all of those individuals would be familiar, do not be afraid of sudden terror. It's going to happen. Nor of trouble from the wicked when it comes. Not if it comes, but when it comes. For the word will be your confidence, will keep your foot from being caught. We've been using 
words to kind of illustrate these points with a, with a word that begins with the letter P. And the same thing's true here. Listen to the words again. Do not be afraid of sudden terror, nor of trouble from the wicked when it comes. What is being stated? Do not panic. Don't panic. It's one of the worst things you can do. Panic-stricken people act with abandon. Panic-stricken people seemingly can forget the principles upon which their life has been based. Panic-stricken people can follow those emotions rather than facts. Panic-stricken people, if not careful, can decide to turn their back on God even after they have endeavored to live for Him for decades. Do not panic. And as significant as these other ones, other points have been in this chapter, point number seven is just as significant. Do not be afraid of sudden terror when it comes, not if. In the next two verses, in verse 27 and verse 28, a different point is being made. Do not withhold good from those to whom it is due, when it is in the power of your hand to do so. Do not say to your neighbor, go and come back, and tomorrow I'll give it to you when you have it with you. And this is You can remember words of Jesus that are reflective of this. It's late at night, you're already in bed, and your neighbor says, I have, a, have need for food or something and you tell him that you're already in bed you just can't open the door now basically come back later that's the kind of thought that's here do not withhold good from those to whom it is due when it is in the power of your hand to do so do not say to your neighbor go and come back tomorrow I'll give it to you when you have it with you do not postpone doing good do not put off putting good Postponing honorable deeds, postponing charitable acts, putting off being benevolent is never an indication of somebody who loves humanity. More times than not, if we're not careful, it's in a reflection of, I don't want to be inconvenienced. And that puts us in a, in a category of thinking about ourselves, not thinking about somebody else. And if that was turned around, if we were the ones seeking help, and somebody said, well, basically, that's, I just don't want to be inconvenienced, we would think how uncaring of them. It would be no surprise then if we respond that way to somebody else. I just, uh, I can't help you now, even though I have the means to do so. I don't want to be inconvenienced. Their thought is not that here's somebody that's following in the footsteps of Jesus. Here's somebody that's being kind of selfish with their time. Here's somebody that's thinking about themselves. Do not postpone doing good. Number nine, verse 29 and 30. Do not devise evil against your neighbor, for he dwells by you for safety's sake. Do not strive with a man without cause, even if he has done harm to you. If he's done harm to you, Even if he's done no harm to you, do not strive with a man without cause. Um, Don't lash out. In fact, if you look at these two verses, do not plot evil things toward other people. You think, well, this person did this to me. It doesn't matter. Well, they haven't done anything. Don't, Don't plot any kind of evil against them, no matter what. And again, emotions in our culture for the last few years have been running at a very high level. Anger, animosity, thinking, maybe some evil, plotting evil, can't do it. Do not devise evil against your neighbor. He dwells by you for safety's sake. Do not strive with a man without cause if he has done you no harm. Don't lash out against anybody, even if he has done you harm. Don't lash out against him. That brings us to the the final Last five verses of this chapter. And it reads this way. Do not envy the oppressor. Choose none of his ways. For the perverse person is an abomination to the Lord. 
But the secret counsel is with the upright. God's counsel is with the upright. The curse of the Lord is on the house of the wicked, but he blesses, God blesses, the home of the just. Surely he, God, scorns the sinful, but gives grace to the humble. The wise shall inherit glory, but shame shall be the legacy of fools. Do not envy evil or oppression. Interesting thing about these five verses, and there's another P word in this passage. He actually equates those who envy the perverse person as somebody that's an abomination to God. Not just the person that is involved in perverse things, evil and oppression, but the individual that follows that. So therefore, do not even envy those that live that way. Do not choose any of their ways. For the perverse person is an abomination to the Lord. But the secret counsel of God is with the upright. Proverbial points to learn from and to follow. 2024 or any year hereafter. And the kind of the kind of things that should guide our life are not just those things that are found in the new, such as those seven items that really need to be pursued by any Christian that Paul writes to Timothy in 1 Timothy 6 and 2 Timothy 2, but points that are as eternal as God himself, based upon wisdom and knowledge and understanding. Ten points in this early chapter in the wisdom book of Israel, Proverbs chapter 3. Hope everyone stays safe and hope that we see each other again in fellowship next week. Once again, let's close with a prayer. Father, thank you so much once again for the time to open up your word to look at what it contains, to see the significance of each line, of each point, the priority that's made in the way that we live our lives by these qualities and these characteristics that bring us ever closer to you. Watch over each member of this congregation as we are separated. Bring us back soon that we can once again be together. Not our will, Father, but yours be done in all things. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.